Okay, let's uh, get settled so that we start on time and hopefully end on time. You are welcome to today's uh, presentation. Uh, the title is Hadoop on OpenStack Cloud. Uh, this presentation is actually based on a proof of concept that was undertaken by our team uh, in Dell EMC, uh, based in uh, Austin, Texas. The executive sponsor for this um, project was uh, Dr. Akadi Kanevsky, who is going to be a presenter, and you'll get to know more about him when he presents. And uh, Mr. Fazal Khan uh, was the contractor who did most, if not all, the work. And my name's uh, Nicholas Wakou, and I was the lead engineer on this project. So what we have for you today is we'll show you the reference architecture that we used for uh, this uh, POC, and then the motivation. Why did we do it? And then we'll take you through the tests that were performed and how they were performed. We'll share the results that we got. We conclude after that, hopefully within time. Um, we intend this to be an interactive session, so feel free to ask questions. But we request that those questions should be specific, precise, and to the point, so that that way we can um, get through everything that we intend to share with you. So without much ado, I will call upon Dr. Akadi Kanevsky to start off the discussion. Thank you. So let me talk a little bit about motivation. Why did we start this, uh, this endeavor? Um, it's very simple. Uh, we actually in uh, Dell MC have a, a solution uh, which was uh, optimized for Hadoop and uh, it's actually working very well. And we have another solution, which is uh, OpenStack one. Um, and they're not too far apart with respect to the hardware and the configuration they're using. And the uh, obvious question arised, um, OK, if you want to run the Hadoop on OpenStack, how far is performance, uh, how close is the performance you're going to get between the, uh, uh, the, the runs you're going to have on the kind of optimized hardware configuration uh, solution versus the cloud one? So we first we kind of do two things. One is we looked at what is the hardware which we use for the Hadoop solution, and what is the hardware we use for the OpenStack solution, specifically for Compute Node, because um, that's where the bulk of the work is. We figure out that the additional load uh, which will be generated for OpenStack itself for creating the networks, uh, creating the volumes and attaching them, creating VMs and so on, would not be too big of a deal, uh, at least that was our thought, so we kind of stick with that. Um, the other thing is that we wanted to make sure that the hardware uh, configuration with respect to RAID BIOS and several other things which are underlying hardware configuration are identical for both of them. So um, we, I'll get in the, a little bit more details of what specific hardware was uh, in a minute. Um, and then we said, okay, what are we going to use to evaluate that from the benchmarking point of view? Because we want it to be something, something which we can uh, relate, relate to. And we chose uh, uh, TPCH uh, HS benchmark, which is the one uh, which we publish uh, when we release our uh, Hadoop solution to, uh, as a part of the verifiable thing uh, which you know, uh, community can uh, can see the results and publish. And it's published through the TPC consortium uh, and various other uh, vendors and uh, uh, companies publish those results. So um, the architecture we chose was specifically uh, kind of the bare minimal we can do to kind of start the work. Um, and uh, that is following the model which we have for our OpenStack solution. Um, the results presented here are on slightly older version uh, of the solution, so it is uh, actually run uh, on the Liberty uh, code base, uh, but as you can, we'll see from the results we are doing, 
uh, you know, the results are not really impacted by the version of the OpenStack per se. Um, so one other point I wanted to make uh, is that uh, while the, our Hadoop OpenStack solution basically optimized by the administrator, so administrator have the full control of the entire, the, all the whole, you know, all of the hardware, servers, switches, uh, and storage. Uh, the same is not true for the OpenStack because that's a clear separation layer between what is a user uh, you can do and what you can see. Uh, so the design which we came up with, uh, and we'll go into more details as we go through each of the results, is that uh, we are providing the architecture and configuration which we recommend for the, uh, targeted for the Hadoop configurations. But from the user point of view, they don't see that. They operate as a standard OpenStack APIs and don't know any difference. So the, uh, hard, from the hardware point of view, um, it's fairly typical uh, OpenStack configuration. We have one uh, simple node which we use for administrative purposes. Uh, for uh, this work, uh, we use triple O to, for doing deployment and controlling uh, the configuration of the nodes. We have uh, HA environment, so we have three controller nodes where all of the uh, OpenStack services are running. Uh, we have three nodes uh, where we are running the compute, um, and we, we you, some of the results were using some of the uh, lighter compute nodes with respect to the memory and uh, uh, cores available on the, uh, in the processors. Uh, but you know, those are not, uh, they will not impact the final results because the final results were run actually on the same hardware we use for both bare metal Hadoop cluster as well as uh, compute nodes on the, uh, on the Hadoop, uh, for the OpenStack. And finally, uh, we use the Ceph as a storage layer, uh, both for the block and for the image store. Uh, we could, uh, we have not uh, done the investigation what will happen when you have uh, your data on the Ceph as an object storage and try to process it out of there. But given uh, how uh, the performance result we have for Ceph for the block, we don't expect that going through the object interface will improve the performance drastically. Moreover, we expect that because we have to go through the RGW, through the, uh, through the control plane to get to the to data, we expect the results will be worse. So once we got the result on the self block storage, it, you know, we realize that probably we don't want to go there because it's not how we're going to get any improvements. Um, if you are the true hardware buff, that here is the configuration we use. Those are you know, off-the-shelf standard um, Dell hardware. Uh, we use kind of two flavors of the nodes, the 630s, uh, which was originally what we use for the compute nodes, are somewhat lighter with respect to the storage capabilities. Um, and that's usually good enough for most of the compute, uh, compute, compute loads, uh, for uh, cloud native apps, for dev and test. Um, but they cannot uh, sustain the same number of the storage capacity. Um, so for that, what we used for both uh, the Ceph nodes and also for the compute nodes for actual true test comparison between uh, again the Hadoop, we use the 730s, uh, which have uh, 24 disks uh, with uh, I think 1.6 capacity uh, per disk. Uh, so this kind of compares apples to apples because we use identical hardware for the bare metal Hadoop and for the open stack on the Hadoop. Um, so this I'll pass the baton to Fazal to go into the details. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. So as Arkadi has already discussed the motivation of this POC and uh, the reference architecture, I'll quickly walk you through the deployment of our system under test and uh, OpenStack Sahara's architecture and its components. So. Um, OpenStack Sahara provides a robust interface to easily provision and scale Hadoop clusters. Um, as an OpenStack component, it is fully integrated into the OpenStack ecosystem. So a user can administer an entire Hadoop workflow from the Horizon GUI, uh, from configuring a cluster all the way to launching jobs on them. Uh, 
A typical Sahara cluster consists of name node instances and multiple data node instances. So all those instances were deployed and configured by OpenStack Sahara. So uh, we benchmarked uh, the Cloudera distribution of Hadoop version 5.3 uh, using TPCX HS as the test workload. Uh, TPCX HS uh, was the first industry, uh, first benchmark standard by a major uh, per industry standard performance consortium. And uh, this in particular is a derivative of uh, Apache Hadoop uh, workload, TerraGen, TerraSort, and TerraValidate. So this uh, test workload was installed and uh, executed from the name node instance by the cloud user. And as Arkady has already mentioned, that the underlying hardware configurations were not were kept hidden from the cloud user. Um, coming to the OpenStack uh, Sahara's architecture, as you can see, just like any other OpenStack component, you see uh, we have auth, REST API, data access layer that persists internal models in the cloud database, and then the provisioning engine, which is responsible for uh, uh, actually provisioning the Hadoop cluster using uh, heat orchestration services. Then there are vendor plugins. So vendor plugins are basically a pluggable mechanism which lets you uh, deploy a specific when, uh, Hadoop distribution. I'll talk more about it in the next slide. Then we have EDP, which is Elastic Data Processing, and uh, it just helps you um, manage and launch jobs from uh, uh, from the Sahara's core component. And uh, just like any other OpenStack uh, component, we are Sahara has its own uh, Python client and uh, the Sahara dashboard. It's uh, fully integrated into Horizon. And uh, you can deploy a cluster, um, resize it, or even delete it from uh, the single click of buttons. Uh, looking into the components, uh, the major components include the plugins, which I've already told are the pluggable mechanisms. Uh, so there are uh, several uh, plugins uh, available as of now, including Apache Vanilla, Cloudera Distribution of Hadoop, Hortonworks Ambari, and some others. Um, next is the image registry. As you all know, that OpenStack starts virtual machines based on a pre-built image and uh, an installed OS. Uh, so uh, the requirement of images for Sahara actually depends upon the plugin that you're using as well as the framework version. So some plugins might require uh, a simple cloud image and will install the framework uh, on it on the machines from the scratch, while some uh, machines might require uh, images with pre-installed Hadoop packages. So in order to simplify this uh, provisioning process, Sahara employs the concept of uh, templates. Um, there are two types of templates, node group templates and the cluster templates. As the name suggests, node group templates are for node group creation and cluster for cluster creations. Um, uh, basically, uh, uh, templates uh, actually remove the burden of specifying the required parameters each time a cluster needs to be deployed. So, for example, you can have uh, a name node group template of uh, you not only specify the role in the template, but also the flavor and the security policy that you need for the nodes in that node group. So for example, a no name node group template can be of, uh, or you can assign m1.medium flavor to it, and uh, the roles of HDFS uh, name node, secondary name node, uh, yarn job history, and uh, resource manager. And likewise, for data node, you can have HDFS data node and uh, the node manager and you can set it to use uh, the m extra large flavor. And cluster templates, on the other hand, is basically a collection of uh, the same node group templates. So you not only specify which uh, node group templates you want to use in your cluster, but also their quantities. For example, you can have a cluster template with one name node group and three data node groups. So you'll, you'll end up with one name node machine and three data node machines running in your cluster. Provisioning engine is basically the main, uh, is the core component of Hadoop, which uh, instructs heat to communicate with compute, Nova, Neutron, and uh, other OpenStack services. Uh, OpenStack Sahara used to communicate with those services directly, but uh, since the Liberty release, it has been deprecated now, and we have heat engine for that purpose. 
Coming to the methodology that we use for this POC work, uh, first of all, we use the bare metal tests as uh, a baseline for our normalization of the results. So all the uh, tests that were executed in the cloud environment were, uh, and their results were normalized to the bare metal test results. Secondly, we use TPCXHS as the benchmark and its performance matrix for the comparison of those results. In order to evaluate the performance of Hadoop in different cloud configurations, uh, we, need to we had to define some uh, configuration parameters like uh, uh, worker instance configuration where uh, we, def we actually tested how many number of instances per compute node along with the vCPU's RAM and storages allocated to each would give us the better performance. Then uh, we tested CPU over subscription, memory over subscription, and the block storage. So we had two different type of storages available, the shared self storage and the local disks on the compute nodes in the other setup. So we had to test the performance and compare them. Then we tested CPU pinning as well as disk pinning just to see if uh, using those concepts could help us uh, with the, the better, uh, in, in getting the better performance. So we adopted an iterative testing methodology where uh, we iterated through the set of values for each configuration parameter and evaluated the performance. So in this way, uh, we came up with the configuration values uh, that were that, that uh, were giving us the best performance, like uh, each parameter that showed the best performance, we use the same configuration for the subsequent tests, and uh, then we concluded with the best value for each parameter. Um, coming to, uh, this is basically the uh, resource allocation that we used for our instances. So basically we had three different types of instances, the Cloudera Manager instance that uh, we use the Cloudera plugin. So it comes with the ease of using Cloudera Manager as well. So we had just one Cloudera Manager instance with these resources and uh, one name node instance. So the resources for both the Cloudera Manager and the name node were fixed throughout the tests while we iterated through the resources for the worker instances. Um, now I would like uh, Nicholas to come over and talk about the tests and the results. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fazal. Right. So um, we continue um, with the results. Now, when we talk about worker nodes, uh, basically we are talking about data nodes if you are used to the Hadoop lingua. Um, so what we did is we started off with determining the best instance configuration. What kind of Nova flavor should we be using that would give us the best or optimal performance? So what we did was we looked at five um, instance configurations. Uh, three of them were the standard um, Nova flavors, uh, medium, large, and extra large, and then two of them were custom. One of them was just one instance per, per physical uh, server, and the other one was varied. Um, so each of those instance configurations were the tests, so we ended up with about five tests, and through all these tests, we made sure that the total number of CPUs accessed by within the test remained fixed for all the tests. And the same thing was with the amount of memory that was accessed by the, the worker nodes. But we kept on varying the number of worker instances per physical server. Now, what we found out was that there wasn't very much performance difference between the instances, instance configurations. Um, at most, we saw a 5% percent percentage um, difference, but otherwise they were all fairly close. And, but the other thing that we noted was that there was a sweet spot of four instances for each um, uh, uh, physical node. And so, what we ended up doing was that we adopted that as our standard configuration for all the subsequent tests. So 
as you will see later on, uh, the instance configuration, uh, which is really in this case, um, uh, it is shown as four. Uh, that is the one that, actually we called it I5, uh, but that is the one that we ended, we ended up adopting to use for all subsequent tests, and then we, were, we also ended up using only four instances for each physical node. Now, after that, we wanted to see how far we can get away with oversubscription. Um, from, a pers from a performance perspective, we knew that um, you know, oversubscription is definitely going to make you lose performance, but at the same time, sometimes it is a necessary evil, and we just wanted to know how far we could get away with it. So again, using um, the optimized configuration uh, that we call I I5, um, we, we maintained the amount of memory and kept on ramping up the number of, uh, CPU, number of CPUs. We did about four tests, um, in, and each test, the first test had a one-to-one -one ratio between the physical number of CPUs and the logical number of CPUs. Then we ramped up to one to two, one to three, and then one to four. Now, what we found out was that indeed, um, CPU oversubscription is actually not good. Um, a 2x CPU oversubscription will make you lose about 2% of performance. A 3x will make you lose about 13% of your overall performance. And again, when you talk about performance, we're looking at the performance of the Hadoop workload that we were running, and that was the TPC XHS workload, and that's the one that was, we were standardizing uh, on. Next, we tried memory over subscription, and in this case, we maintained the number of CPUs, but ended up ramping up the memory. But in this case, we were ramping up in terms of percentages, uh, not in terms of one, two, or three. Uh, so for instance, we, we, we did a one-to-one -one test, then we did a test that was 10% of a subscription, 20% um, sub of a subscription, and then 30% of a subscription. Um, what we found was that actually, of a memory of a subscription was really a no-no because um, a 10% memory over subscription gave you a 64% performance degradation. So if you were to do any over subscription, you might get away a little bit with CPU over subscription. Memory will really hurt you. So with that information, we decided to move to the next level of testing Again, maintaining an optimal instance configuration and ensuring that there is no memory over subscription. So now we had to make a decision on what kind of storage we should be using. Do we go with safe um, shared storage, which is really what our, our RA at that time was recommending, or do we use local storage. Now, there are many reasons why uh, you could go either way, but we wanted to find out which one gave us the best performance. Um, one of the things that we did was that safe storage comes with um, a replication, a standard replica, a default replication of three. We dialed that one down to one, mainly because the, replica, the, the TPC XHS uh, workload that we were running comes with its own replication of three. So uh, we did that, and uh, what we found was that if you run on local storage, you have a 22% advantage over uh, safe with, re with replication one. And um, so we started seeing that we are, we are ramping up in terms of uh, performance. And now there are many reasons why, obviously, you would use safe. Um, uh, it's not just for performance, but where performance is a serious consideration, you are definitely going to get more if you have, uh, you're using local storage. Then we tried CPU pinning. In, in this case, we just configured our 
instances to be aware of the newer technology of the underlying infrastructure. And, uh, but everything else remained the same. Only thing that we changed was making sure that the CPUs were CPU pinning was in place. Now, the performance improvement was not really dramatic. It was actually quite small. Uh, we think that it was mainly because of the hypervisor overheads and some other things. This is an area where we could have uh, done more investigation. We just didn't have the time to do that. But we got small, very minute performance improvement but it's also an area of further investigation and research. Then we looked at disk pinning, and in this case, again, making the instances to be aware of the I.O. subsystem, and uh, we maintained uh, the NUMA nodes, and then implemented uh, disk pinning on local storage. Um, what we found was we could get an extra 15% due to disk pinning. At this point, we found that we were at 94% of the performance of bare metal. And it was also a time where the, the deadline for completing this uh, project was coming to an end. The executive sponsor was on our back. Uh, he wanted everything wrapped up quickly, so we went to him and said, hey, we are at 94%, is that okay? He said, fine, uh, we can live with that. But at the back of our mind, we knew that we had just touched the top of the iceberg. There is a lot of opportunities within OpenStack that we could have done and that we can still do to not just match bare metal performance, but indeed, not only match it, but even do get better performance than bare metal. We, we, we are now, having done this, we are confident that we, we, if we give it more time, we can actually do that. So this is where we ended. Uh, it's quite possible that maybe we shall continue with it, but I'll ask uh, Mr. Kadi to come and uh, conclude. Uh. Not much left to do. I just wanted to put all of the results together um, and kind of demonstrate um, kind of piece by piece uh, analysis uh, how each of the configuration options uh, change the performance spectrum. Um, so there's several things. I mean, while we use kind of a very clean terminology, CPU pinning and disk pinning, uh, to be very fair, uh, the user of the Hadoop don't see that. The people who deploy Hadoop don't see that at all. Uh, the disk spinning is basically uh, what happens is that you, as an administrator, configures each of the disks on the local uh, on the local uh, compute node as uh, your uh, center volume. So when you, as a user, operate on that, you will uh, attach those volumes locally. So uh, you don't use anything, you don't know anything under the covers. You basically use a standard uh, OpenStack operating calls to operate on the whole thing. Uh, we do under the covers, uh, you know, pinning uh, of the CPUs. We create the VMs of the right size uh, to make sure that they match the best performance. So when Sahara deploys Hadoop, it chooses uh, those VM sizes to operate on. So let us stop at this point. If you have any question, please come to the mic and ask them. Uh, and at the end, we'll have a ruffle. Uh, so my question is, uh, did you try the storage backends different from direct local storage? So did you try LVM-backed uh, solutions? So the LVM-backed, perfect question. So the question is, uh, you know, have you tried the LVM-backed solution? So if you look at the green light, which is called local storage, so that is the LVM back solution. So we take all of the disks uh, on the node, create a single uh, single volume, LVM volume on that, and we expose that volume uh, as a center volume. So when you run the thing, you basically attach a single volume to the uh, uh, to 
combine that across uh, all of the nodes on the uh, all of the VMs which are running on that node. So it's still local storage, uh, and uh, volume is attached to them. But instead of a separate uh, volumes which are pinned to the VM, it's a shared one, and because of that, we see that quite a you know large difference in the performance. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, the work, the reference. Is the, the Springer uh, reference about uh, the paper itself? Uh, Did you publish the results or not? Uh, well, we published it uh, at the... Uh, yeah, um... Yeah, um, so these results were published um, at the TPC Technology Conference. Um, we actually were presented at the TPC Technology Conference uh, that happened in New Delhi uh, in August. And uh, then um, they, they are going to be published by Springer. Okay, so this, this is something to come. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's refer referable material. Uh, it's just, you know, you can reference, of course, a video once it comes out, but there is a, the Springer book which will come out as a, uh, the, from the, I guess it's big data TPC, TPC, uh, uh, it's actually data, uh, it's a big data database conference, uh, which includes a TPC uh, technical conference, uh, and it's published by Springer. And they have, you know, the, the full, the, okay. the, you know, full paper. Yeah, actually it will be very interesting to reproduce the, the setup. And I was wondering whether you will also uh, publish your uh, or share your configurations or something of this kind. So yeah, um, so somewhere among those slides, we actually do have um, the reference, but um, as of now, the full um, the, because it happened so recently, Springer hasn't yet given us the the source. But the paper itself will have all that information that could help you to re reproduce. The, 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 test, the test if you it has wanted a, to. It, full, it has a full configuration information including all of the hardware bumps. Yeah. And, and the last question, it's unfortunate that you didn't uh, reach the point where you will exceed the performance of bare metal, but do you have intuition or hints of how this can be achieved? Yeah, um, I can try that. Well, first of all, um, there are things like using the LVM driver if you went with a road driver, you would probably get better performance. We think that places like um, the, uh, the CPU pinning, there is a possibility that we didn't configure it very efficiently because we only got a 2% performance improvement. There could be more. And there's a ton of other things. Um, again, this was a limited time project. Uh, uh, there's a lot of other things on the OpenStack side that we could do. So I'll mention we have one angle which we have not, we, we wanted to do, didn't have time to do it, and that is we have not tried to optimize uh, the Java virtual machine. Hadoop runs in the JVM, so basically in each VM they have a single JVM running. That have not been optimized for that VM size. Okay. Thank so you. that's where we expect where we'll get the remaining improvements to go over 100%. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, since I'm assuming you probably want to repeat this in depth as you're discussing this, um, have you been evaluating the idea of changing the file system from HDFS to something else? Thank you. Excellent question. So the answer um, to that is twofold. Uh, so the first one was very simple. The only configuration we tried uh, was a replication on a HDFS level and uh, no replication on a Ceph level. So the, the immediate thing which we wanted to do, but again run out of time, was to flip it around. Have a one replication factor on GFS and rely on the Ceph replication factor. So that's one angle to go to. Uh, the second, as you point out, okay, Ceph is just one of the, you know, one of the file systems we can try. We can try different file systems, uh, both on the Ceph level as well as local level. 
you know, again, we tried just uh, standard HDFS configuration. We have not tried uh, switching from, for example, to ext4 or some other some other configure uh, local file system for that. Do you see any candidates for? Yeah. Uh, the Ceph was one of the candidates we actually wanted to try the Ceph file system. Unfortunately, he made us stop. But otherwise, that's something we could have done. <laughs> and um, there's now a ton of other file systems that we have to, uh, that we may consider. But obviously, if we are to get another opportunity, we'll definitely go through a number of them. But safe file system was pretty much at the top of our mind at that time. Yeah. Also, I mean, we, we only tried on a three compute nodes. So I think as we increase the number of compute nodes, so um, you know that we can completely separate the node uh, node instance uh, and uh, Cloudera Manager completely out of the picture. I think we'll we'll get a little bit more balanced performance. That was another angle which we we thought of too, but it's like okay, now we need to reconfigure hardware. Sorry, no, no time for that. <laughs> Any other questions?